The cannabis industry can be very scary and exciting at the same time, but you're not alone. Join the community and understand all the different influential people and ancillary providers who can help you scale and grow your audience and your business. I'm your host, Kamin Tharath. Let's dive into the Cannabis Business Development Podcast. Dr. Kaplan, welcome back. We have another really great special guest today that we're excited to kind of hear her story. And I think a lot of other folks who are in a similar situation, hopefully will be relieved that there's an alternative solution out there for this very, very important topic we're going to talk today. So welcome back. All right. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. And it's a real honor to be here today with Helena. And, and the culture is starting to wrap its mind around pediatrics in cannabis. You know, thankfully, Dr. Gupta on CNN has started his exploration of autism spectrum and how cannabinoids might be involved. You know, we've seen some pretty dramatic images of young children who are really struggling, sometimes, you know, in the CNN case of self-injury, hurting themselves. And I have a great privilege of, of seeing some of these children in my clinic. And, and one of them is Jason, whose mom here has volunteered to share her story. And I'm so excited because there's such a window of opportunity and joy and relief that Elena has been able to share with me that I, I, I wish I could scream on mountaintops because it's such a dramatic opportunity. And there's so many children out there that are suffering, so many families that are suffering. I wanted everybody to sort of come into this opportunity and hear what I've heard. So before I spill it all, Helena, welcome. Thank you for volunteering and, and sharing. It's a real privilege. Thank you. You're very welcome. Would you mind telling us a little bit about Jason and your experience when Jason was very young? So Jason is currently 15 years old. He has a disability of communication disability, along with learning disabilities, and then epilepsy. And epilepsy started back in 2013, to our knowledge. And it basically started off as what it looked like a night terror. That's how I could describe it. I am of Portuguese descendant. I'm 100% Portuguese. And having come from that culture, his episodes actually almost looked like he was possessed. That was my first thought. He would sit up, he would be sleeping, and all of a sudden sit up in bed and just his face would be scrimmaging and his arms shaking. And to me, it just looked like, you know, he was possessed. Then he had one of those events um, in the shower, and then from then on, he was diagnosed with epilepsy. So that's been, it's been our journey. Epilepsy definitely has been challenging. Hmm. When that diagnosis of epilepsy first came, who was helping you through that? So I took him to our local hospital here, and then we were transferred to Boston Children's in Boston one of the best, you know, and he was hospitalized for a week. They ran all kinds of tests, MRIs, EEGs, everything. Nothing really conclusive came back, but they decided that it was best to put him on an anti-seizure medication. And not knowing any better, I went along with it. And then he went just about a year without having any events. And then after the one year mark, he started having them again. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, when Jason was very young and when you were, you know, relatively young too, what was your experience with cannabis? What did you thought about when it comes to cannabis? You know, what was your perspective on it? So I had no experience with cannabis at all. And to be honest, it was one of those things that was like, ooh, that's a drug. You don't touch that. <laughs> You know, so it was that mentality that that's not something that you do. And um I, I had never even been in contact with anybody that had done, had smoked or done any type of, you know, medical marijuana or, or any type. So it was totally unknown to me. Mm -hmm. And did anybody in the medical establishment talk to you about it? Did, did they bring it up? Did they offer suggestions? So at that point, no. So we stayed with Boston Children's up until 2015 when I had found out about treating Jason with cannabis and they were like, yeah, no, we can't support that. So we ended up leaving Boston Children's because of that. They were not supportive of that mm -hmm. at all. I see. So, so it wasn't just, they couldn't give it to you, certainly that, but they, mm -hmm. they not only wouldn't talk about it, but they couldn't even support it. If you were doing it, that means, sorry, we can't help you. Correct. They were not supportive of it all. Like, let's say if Jason was hospitalized, I couldn't even bring it into the hospital if I needed to. That was a big no-no. 
they wouldn't even have the discussion with me about it. Mm -hmm. And neither did his pediatrician at the time either. Yeah. Right, and just for folks watching, you know, from the hospital perspective, cannabis is a schedule one substance. You know, yeah. if, if it was purple dust, because the government says this is not allowed, they can't prescribe it in the hospital. They can't interact with it. On the nursing side, the nurses are contracted not to deal with things which, you know, have certain standing in the government, like a schedule one substance. So the nurses can't deal with it. The doctors can't prescribe it. It's not allowed in the hospital system. It puts doctors and the hospital in, in a very awkward position when the culture is moving forward with cannabis, but you know their laws are not. And that's one of the huge arguments nationally around changing the government's perspective is that we want people who are in hospital situations just like this to have other options. Okay, so when you had first engaged with cannabis, what did that look like? Did, did someone throw cannabis at you and say, hey, try it? Did they talk to you about it first? What was the beginning like? So actually, I had seen a video, and I don't recall if it was on like Facebook or if it was on TV, about Charlotte's Web, which was designed to help treat a young girl named Charlotte. And that was my first try. I tried the CBD route first, tried that. At that point, we had transferred Jason Spear to Tufts Medical, and his neurologist there was very supportive. Like, he wouldn't provide recommendations or, you know, dosage or anything like that, but he was supportive of me using it. So it was definitely trial and error. And then I was also introduced to the real cannabis by a local nurse who's actually a cannabis nurse now. And she introduced me to the real cannabis. And I ended up um, kind of baking brownies. That was my first step, <laughs> I baked brownies. And packed a brownie for him for snack at school, a little bite-sized brownie. So that's how I started. And within that first couple of days, like there was a, an immediate change that I saw in Jason. It was like, wow, like he would say something and I'm like, wait, did he really just say that? Like that clear, you know? And even my neighbor at the time who used to watch him after school, she's like, what are you doing different for Jason? Something is different. <laughs> So then, you know, I, of course I fessed up and yeah, that's how it started. Yeah. Wow. It's so dramatic. I can't wait to dive in. Come, what were you going to say? As a parent, right. We're going to do anything we can to help our kids. Yeah. How did you feel when you're like, okay, I'm going to pack this cannabis brownie as a snack in my kid's lunch to bring to school. So it was one of those feelings that, like you said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to help my child. And I would tell him, buddy, just, it's a small brownie. I want you to just put it in your mouth all at once and don't talk to anybody about it. And it was nerve wracking. It really was because, you know, I was taking that chance of somebody reporting him or whatever, but nope, we were lucky. It didn't happen. Hmm. To rewind just a sec, back to the time where you were trying Charlotte's Web. Most people probably know these days, but Charlotte's Web is a CBD company, which is selling CBD. What did you notice when Jason was taking CBD? Any changes at all? No. No, nope. okay. I didn't start noticing the changes until I introduced, um, so it was a CBD, but it had THC in it. So mm -hmm. it was the real cannabis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Had small amounts that were legal for them to ship and sell. Right. Um, so actually that was through the black market here. <laughs> oh, okay. So you had CBD, but then you also had THC that you were giving. Correct. Great. Okay. And noticed not much at all. Nothing there. So when he was just on, on the Charlotte's web now. When I started introducing the brownies, which I was using local cannabis at that point, then yes, that's when I saw the change. I see. And what kinds of things did you try when you first had the CBD? Did you try a couple drops? Did you try a whole bottle full? What was the daily sort of regimen? So I think it was at that point, I started with like four or five drops and then increased it. By the time I discontinued it, I think we were at a full dropper, which I believe it was a whole ML. And then I wasn't seeing anything. So then we discontinued it. Okay. So there's a lot of people watching out there because I see them in my office who try CBD and feel frustrated because it doesn't really do anything. And, and one of the things, you know, I'm trying to underscore here is even though there's that frustration, there's still opportunity with a full plant. Right now, the laws are not allowing THC to be sold over the counter to everybody, but in regions and in, in some states, it's legal now. And the opportunity that you're highlighting, which I'm, I'm thrilled to hear, 
is for people to see that sometimes CBD is not going to cut it, that you do need other cannabinoids to make it work at all. Okay. So at the time you were giving Jason Brownie in his lunch, things seemed like they were going well. You mentioned that there was some verbal improvements. Were there any other improvements and then anything on the downside that you noticed that made you concerned? So I saw definitely his communication improved and his demeanor itself was, he was happier, like Mm. (laughs) no pun intended, but he was really, you know, he he was perkier. So at the time when I started this, he was on six different medications. Mm. So he had put on uh, an, an insane amount of weight and he was like a zombie, you know, barely functioning. And just to see that, and it was immediate once I started those brownies, it was immediate. You could see a change in him. Yeah. Mm. A much happier kid. I mean, there's nothing to say that sort of speaks for itself. Did you notice anything that made you pause or give you cause to think twice about it? No. One of the things that the pediatrician, once he became a, a legal medical cannabis user, the pediatrician would always say, you know, Keep in mind, this could affect his learning. And, and I'm like, at this point, his seizures are causing more damage than anything. So I'm willing to take all those risks. And okay. knowing what you know now, thinking back on what that pediatrician was saying, have you noticed any risks, any evidence of concern having done it now for, for many years? I mean, he hasn't regressed. It's challenging because he has other issues. So it's challenging to know really Is it all the damage that the seizures have caused? Probably. I don't believe it's the cannabis that is causing any issues at all. I I do believe it's all the damage from all the seizures that he would have. Good. Yeah. No. And and to be totally fair, you know, we don't know, and there is evidence of some temporary concerns, but in most of the long-term literature that we can read, we don't see long-term damage. And, And to your point, which I think is the most important of all, there is clear damage happening because of these other illnesses. And so the idea to think that only cannabis is going to be the bad guy and not the seizures that are hurting his brain is not fair. That could happen. Like for all the parents, like what's the timeline? How does someone consider like A-B tests, different things? Like what's a recommendation to really know if it's working or not? It takes time because, you know, each kid is different. Each illness is different. And then of course the cannabis is different too. And you know, we don't have a system where everybody with seizures takes the same medicine. We don't have a system where everybody who has seizures is the same. So there's a little bit of give and take. There's a little bit of test and learn for each person. Uh, The process has to be done individually. And there are telltale signs that things are going well. You know, one of the things we heard from Helena is that Jason wasn't experiencing anything awful happening. You know, in the 1930s, the reefer madness movies showed people jumping out of windows and and crawling out of their skin and all kinds of ridiculous caricatures. None of that actually happens. And that's important to know that when you're looking at someone who's starting out with cannabis at the beginning, there's nothing unusual happening. Maybe the unusual is that they're smiling or that they're speaking in a way that they haven't in a long time. So as long as your maternal instincts, your parental instincts look like they're going well, that's a good sign. I mean, that's obviously in stark contrast to things were not going well before the cannabis. Parents who are, again, are questioning or still are always looking for the potential worse. Is there any negative or any, like, what are the, the severe things that could happen for folks who are trying cannabis? So, yeah, the concerns really depend on where someone is starting. You know, a lot of the children that I see are starting from a place of severe deficits, severe disabilities. They're not functioning the way we think about children normally functioning. So if they're starting at a disadvantage from behind the line, anything which can move them toward a line of feeling like they're happy, the parents seeing that they're eating more normally, if they're not hurting themselves, if they can communicate and potentially learn more, all of these are pushing toward the line, not away from the line. Those are important signals. But all of these patients, you know, I think should be guided with a doctor. The parents should be deeply involved. This is not something happening to the children that everybody's not on the same page about. You know, one of the beauties of Helena as a engaged mother is that Jason has the chance to explore cannabinoids with her and she gets to see what's a right dose, what's not a right dose, 
that's a real challenge for her. She's had to put in a lot of hours and stress and worry, but you know, in the end it, it pays. So Helena, the question to you is information is abundant out there. So like walk us through, like, how did you find the right information? Like, cause parents are probably just Googling things, right? They're asking people that might be giving them misinformation. And this is a conversation Dr. Kaplan and I always have is like, it's hard to find the right information. So like walk us through in the beginning of what it was like and to what it is now. And then what advice would you give someone who's looking to research? So in the beginning, it definitely was challenging because there wasn't much out there for pediatric cannabis, especially here in Massachusetts. And with Massachusetts regulations, you have to have a registered pediatrician to sign off on on the certification along with another registered uh, physician. So just trying to find that pediatrician was challenging. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to I reached out to a doctor out in Boston who did like natural medicine and stuff like that. And she was kind enough to kind of direct me to the city where this pediatrician lived or worked, I should say. And that's how I was able to locate that pediatrician based on that. But it was challenging because the cost, the process of submitting that application, everything had to be done on paper. And then trying to find, you know, a place where I could purchase the cannabis at that point in time. That was also challenging. So for a while, we were kind of like in the black market (laughs) until our local dispensary opened up. And it's been a great sun just knowing that I can walk into a facility and purchase his medicine and not be judged, not be questioned, anything like that. You can't beat that at all. So Dr. Kaplan, what would a parent do today? So I think there's evolution, right? That's happened since Helena has been going through this process. So what would that look like for a parent today? Yeah. So thankfully that experience has moved forward, but unfortunately it hasn't moved forward as far as we all would want. I mean, today in Massachusetts, there are very few pediatricians who do pediatric cannabis. And and that's, that's certainly true elsewhere in the country. It's very difficult for moms across the country who want to explore this, who want to learn about it even as basic as, as just learning from a doctor about it, that's a challenge. So that has slowly improved. There still aren't enough clinicians out there. The numbers of dispensaries has skyrocketed. When Helena first started, there were you know barely a handful. Now there are over 200 dispensaries in Massachusetts. The products are also still very much at their infancy. The industry right now is dominated with very specific THC and CBD products that are aimed to make these dispensaries money. They're not so much focused on, for example, young children who might want small doses or might want different varieties of ingredients, which are more suitable for children. So the industry has a long way to go, but you know, the paper process that Helena went through used to be agonizing. And now Massachusetts has done a spectacular job. The whole thing can be done almost overnight. I had one patient, it took almost six months to get through. And, and to the state's credit, Massachusetts is an incredibly efficient system, but it takes time and patience. It's a process we're all going through as a culture. And I think thankfully going in the right direction. So bringing to today, Helena, how's Jason doing? What is life like today? So life today is he's a typical teenager, 15. (laughs) He's a sophomore in high school. You know, the rolling of the eyes attitude is comes out whenever he's not pleased with mom, you know, those kinds of things. He's only on one seizure medication now. And he's being treated with that in the cannabis, that's it. So he's pretty healthy. You know, he's just totally different child. He's, he lost all that weight that he had put on from all the medications. He looks great. He's happy. Totally, totally different child from when we first started our journey with cannabis. Is he still getting brownies in his lunchbox or what's his (laughs) cannabis look like these days? No brownies in the lunchbox anymore. No. No, he only gets his cannabis right before bed. Awesome. Anything uncomfortable about the experience? Anything that seemed alarming to you or that you didn't like? I mean, not really. I mean, I've had a couple of experiences where, you know, doctors kind of frowned upon us using it. One was a hospitalization in the emergency room. They kind of looked at me like, you know, what are you doing to your child? And, and we had to leave the pediatrician that we were at because he wasn't in agreement with what we were doing. So we did find somebody else. 
but it's been basically, uh, you know, me on my own. And I'm lucky enough that his neurologist is very supportive. And he's like, don't give up and just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, so that in itself has been a tremendous, tremendous help. But other than that, I mean, I'm always open to talk about it. And I, I try to share it as much as I can. Um, I do have a couple of moms that we kind of connected with on Facebook and we kind of help each other out. But not many people are doing the true cannabis. You know, they are doing the prescription. Oh my goodness. What's the name of it? I forget. Epidiolex? Yes, thank you. <laughs> they are using that. But that wasn't even like an offer for Jason at, at any point. And it's one of those things. I just went with my gut and did what I needed to do for him. Mm -hmm. the, it sounds like there's sort of two pools of clinicians, doctors that you've met. Um, one that seems supportive and open, and the other seems pretty closed, if not kind of condemning you for doing what you feel is best for Jason. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about the doctors who, I guess, inspired you or, or felt like made you feel comfortable doing what you're doing? So it's funny that you asked that because when we were at Children's Great Hospital, but it got to a point that I felt that I wasn't being listened to. And I had heard, again, through another mom, I had heard about this neurologist who was doing a presentation on cannabis. And I went to that presentation and the next day I called his office and the assistant was like, I'm sorry, he doesn't have an appointment for months. I'm like, please, I'm begging you. And she was able to get us in there. And once we met him, he was like, uh, no, we need to do something. He needs to get off of these meds that he's on. And I was telling him about how I had introduced Charlotte's web. And he's like, that's great keep doing it. And then once we figured out that Charles Webb wasn't really doing anything, he says, you know, you may want to try something more, a little local and try to get that into him. He was still to this day, he's very supportive. He doesn't judge me, you know, he's, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to translate what you said, because it's so important. You know, this doctor came to you and didn't know what you were taking didn't know whether it would work or not, but clearly has had some research to understand that there was potential for, for good results and just encouraged you to do what you thought was best from your instincts. And, you know, it turned out to be effective in this case. It doesn't always, but, you know, we're mm -hmm. thankful it did here. Did the positive doctor offer you any kind of warning? Was it just like cheerleading saying, go, go cannabis? Or was there a sort of, was it an even-handed discussion? No, it was definitely an even-handed discussion. He wouldn't provide dosage or anything like that. He, he would be like, you know, just make sure you go slow, watch. He would advise weekends are your best weekends and school vacations. That's when you can play with those dosages because he doesn't have to go to school the next day. You know, those kinds of advice that he would provide. Just knowing that he wasn't judging me and he was there to support me, that in itself was extremely helpful. Yeah. Which I think is actually fair game to expect of all clinicians. I mean, that is part of our job is to be there for our patients, I understand. In the other group of doctors who kind of gave you the side eye or judged you, can you share a little bit more about what that was like for you? You know, that particular incident in the ER, was it was challenging because here I am doing what's best for my child. You know, we hear this slogan that, you know, moms know their children better than anybody and then, you know, when you go and you're in front of a professional and he's questioning what you're doing, it, it's one of those double-edged swords because here I am, I think I'm doing what's best for my child and you're judging me for it. So definitely it, it was challenging, but it was one of those, thank goodness it was only the ER doctor, but <laughs> definitely it hurt. Mm. Yeah, no, I understood. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're strong enough to pay attention to what you knew was right. Because in the end, you were right. Yep. One of the things I'm, I'm hoping we'll have is a whole audience of parents out there who are watching and wondering if cannabis is right for their child who's suffering. If you could share advice to them, what would you say? I would just say, if that's what you want to do for your child, then go for it. You know your child best. You know what they're going through the suffering that they're going through, if there's anything that can help them, go for it. Take it slow. Go one day at a time and take it slow. Don't overdo it. The motto is definitely 
low and slow. You start with a low dose and then you start increasing and go that route. And I've had, like, I, I can think of Jason when I have tried a different kind, it was a, a THC um, distillate and he reacted weird to it. So I knew immediately that that was not good for him. And I stopped using that and went back to the, the RSO that he's currently using. And uh, I just knew it. Like, you know your child, you know how they are, you know, at the first sign of anything that's off, you know that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then you, you know, you just pull back. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid, go for it. Great. And to, and to your credit, you know, that was an area where you didn't know what to do, but you were trusting your instincts. Yep. You know, for folks who are curious, THC distillate is a very concentrated, hyper intense version of THC. RSO, which Helena described, is a much more full plant selection. And in that case, you know, some people do respond differently one to the other, but you had the wherewithal, the insight to say, okay, I'm seeing something that I don't like. Let's try something else. Mm -hmm. Great. So Dr. Ben, on the business end of it, right, there are definitely a lot of businesses out there who are impact driven, right? Cannabis is not about revenue. A lot of times people think like folks are getting into this business because of the revenue opportunities. But for, for those who really are caring to want to help other kids and really get into educating and providing a solution to help parents, just like Helena, like what needs to change for these businesses that get this opportunity who are interested in this? I mean, I think you have a whole, a whole market here that is untapped. I mean, what, what Helena and I are describing is a huge population that wants to learn more, wants to experience more, wants to have opportunities that are greater, and it's not being delivered from every aspect of the industry, from advertising and education to, to print work, to dispensaries, to follow-ups, to groups. I mean, all of these people are going to need channels of communication. They're going to need what to do. And this is an entire market, I think, that really needs flourishing. Helena, what about your thoughts? You know, it was so hard for yourself to find resources and businesses and companies. Like, what would you like to see you know, in the future? I mean, I myself, now that I've found Dr. Kaplan in his office, it's a lot easier because both doctors are right there. So having more doctors available, you know, especially once we go back to in-person visits, you know, right now telehealth therapy is working wonderfully because otherwise I would have to travel. So having somebody more local to us would definitely become handy when that time comes. The dispensaries, we have quite a few of them in our area. So that's something that's become a lot easier. The other piece that I would say is the dispensary that I use, the owner has been extremely generous with us. If it wasn't for his generosity, I don't think we would be able to afford Jason's care with the mm -hmm. cannabis because of the cost. So if owners of the dispensaries could really take a look at the pediatric patients and kind of offer that to their parents, I wouldn't be where we are if it hadn't been for his generosity at all. That's a huge point. I mean, we're, we're in the middle of a change, I think, in this culture. Mark Cuban just announced a website which is um, offering pharmaceuticals at greatly reduced pricing. And I think, you know, certainly the politicians have talked about how overpriced pharmaceuticals are. But unfortunately, it's true of the cannabis industry that the prices are quite expensive for many people. And that varies widely from East Coast to West Coast. But nonetheless, as a parent of, of a child who's gone through a lot of suffering, there's often tremendous expenses. And it's a real struggle beyond normal situations in medicine. So I think one of the opportunities in business is to figure out how to support this community. I mean, you know, at some point, these are real people with real struggles and we have to approach it from a hu humanitarian perspective that we don't want our children to be suffering. Um, we don't want anybody else's children to be suffering. And maybe this is a, a special class of, of business that can be treated more respectfully. Any other insights? that you would like to share Helena with us you know it, this is a wonderful story and we're so happy to see that your son and, and your family are in a better place so any final words that you'd like to share with us or advice to the listeners I mean again it's just go and trust your instincts as a mom or a dad you know your children better I can't even describe put it in towards what it's like to watch your child have a generalized seizure and 
not knowing if they're going to make it because mm -hmm. there is that possibility that they could pass away during their sleep and the effect that has had on our family. I mean, till this day, every single noise that I hear coming from his bedroom, as a matter of fact, I sleep in his bedroom. I have a bed that I, a single bed that I sleep in his bedroom because I would consider that I have epilepsy PTSD because I just can't, I can't let myself not be in the room with him because I'm afraid that he's going to have a seizure and I'm not going to hear it and he's going to suffocate. But he luckily, and I'm crossing all my fingers, has not had a generalized seizure in over a year. So to have that relief is unbelievable. I would have never thought to be in this place where we are. And I do believe that it's, you know, it's the cannabis that is helping him. And just to bring my child back and bring my teenager to life, it, there's no money that, you know, can buy that for sure. And my advice to all the parents is just go with your gut, do what's best for your child and for your family. Wow. That's really beautiful, Helena. I, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story and your heart. Um, I hope everybody that's watching is listening because this is what I get to hear and, and, and it's really an honor. For those who are watching and, and interested in learning more, I'm always available. And Helena has, has graciously offered to share her contact if you want to reach out to her directly. Those will be in the notes of the video. Honestly, Helena, I can't improve on what you said. It's from the heart and it's exactly what everybody needs to hear. The doctors who are watching, the patients that are watching, the families, this is the new reality. Um, and the sooner we embrace it, I think the sooner we help everybody. Thank you very much. And, and Dr. Ben, thank you for your time again. And looking forward for our, our, our next guests to share their story around this. And I think it's wonderful that we're able to use this platform to kind of just provide more education. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks so much, Elena. Appreciate it. You're Thanks, very man. welcome. Thank you for letting me share my story. Thanks for spending your time with us. This podcast is for you. And if you have any topics you'd like to learn more about or suggestions, please email us at podcast at indicativemarketing.com. And don't be a stranger. Connect with me on LinkedIn.